Hello, everyone. Let me just get my clock started here. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about WebGL, GPUs, and math. And there's a little thing in parentheses there that will become more obvious as we go on. Let's get rid of that. Uh, so this is my website, in case you haven't seen it. Um, it's generally known as the website with that header. Uh, people don't actually scroll down that much, which is a shame, but, you know, that's life. <laughs> uh, but it's made in WebGL, and what's really cool about this um, effect is that it's kind of its own progress bar, uh, that as the effect animates, it's still doing a lot of the computation, and that's why it's so instant, is because it, it doesn't actually do any work before animating, or barely any. Uh, so that's a nice trick. And um, I was playing with this sort of uh, concept of streaming graphics into a GPU and found that it was really fast because this uh, object has something like 45,000 uh, triangles in it. And, you know, it runs fine. Uh, it, this is a, a modern machine, but even on an older machine, this runs pretty well. So I was really happy with that and wanted to see where I could uh, take it. Now, I've been working on uh, mathematical visualization, and so... There's a quote that I ran into that I, I think is really um, inspirational and says a lot about what I'm trying to do. And it comes from a mathematician named William Thurston, uh, who died not so long ago. So I'd like to, to read that. And he said, I think a lot of mathematics is really about how you understand things in your head. It's people that did mathematics. We're, we're not just general purpose machines. We're people. We see things. We, we feel things. We think of things. A lot of what I've done in my mathematical career has had to do with finding new ways to build models, to see things, do computations, really get a feel for stuff. It may seem unimportant, but when I started out, people drew pictures one way, and I started drawing them a different way. There's something significant about how the representation in your head profoundly changes how you think. It's very hard to do a brain dump, very hard to do that. But I'm still going to try to do something to give a feel for this kind of stuff. Words are one thing. We can talk about geometric structures. There, there are many precise mathematical words that could be used, but they don't automatically convey a feeling for it. I probably can't convey a feeling for it either, but I want to try. And so that is, is pretty much what I want to do too, is, is to try and convey a feeling for things that are, are difficult and, and hard to think about. Uh, so let's begin. I'm going to start with pixels. It's not a strange concept. And oh, there's a loading little thing. Oh, never mind. Uh, pixels. We all know pixels. They live on a grid. And there's a, an x and a y coordinate system. And oddly enough, in, in WebGL and in mathematics in general, y points up. It's annoying that there's different conventions. But you just have to deal with it. Uh, and pixels have been around since the early 80s. And we've had lots of fun little uh, algorithms to deal with them. Like, for example, the Bresenham line drawing algorithm which you, know, you can imagine is just a simple for loop to fill in a couple pixels and, and set the right color. Uh, fat lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines, uh, you can do that too. But you quickly discover that it isn't just about filling in pixels, it's about doing operations with pixels, like for example, blending them in, in true color, as they call it initially. And this isn't going to surprise anybody, but colors are made of red, green, blue primaries, which comes from the human visual system, right? Like we have red, green, blue cones in our eyes, and they're, they're sensitive to specific wavelengths. And that's how, how the colors uh, get mixed and created. Now, on the inside, in those pixels, are, are numbers. And usually, uh, those are 8-bit numbers, a uh, number from 0 to 255, one for the red, green, blue, and transparency channel. And those create those colors. And it's not that I don't think people in this room don't know this, but it's, again, it's about conveying a feeling like a feeling of what happens when all these pixels are being animated in real time uh, with the linear interpolation operator, which I don't have to explain, because Courtney did that uh, in her talk. And so when, when you're changing uh, a value in CSS or changing uh, a transparency in Photoshop or something, you're really directing thousands of pixels with a single slider. And, and I think it's important to point out that this is actually what's going on. So human color vision is additive. Uh, the, the confusion about primary colors uh, stems from the, the difference between additive and subtractive color, where uh, some people say the primary colors are red, yellow, blue, but actually it's cyan, magenta, yellow, which uh, happens because on paper with ink, the more ink, the darker it gets. With light, the more light, the lighter it gets. So they're just opposite. That's, that's what's going on there. Uh, so that's how human color vision works. 
But the RGB model that we use, it's sRGB, standard RGB, is actually not linear. So that means that 50% gray is actually not half as bright as, as white. It just isn't. There's, there's a curve there. So you have to be aware of that, especially when you're, you're doing computations with numbers. And so all of this is part of the general practice of rasterization, drawing things on a grid of pixels, like, say, uh, a triangle. And again, this is decades old stuff by now. But there's a problem. Like, if you're trying to rasterize a triangle like this, uh, it, it kind of skips around a little bit. And the reason is because if you work with a pixel grid, it's natural to define your coordinates as, as the, the pixels. But that means you can only move them in, in integer steps, which is obviously not good for smooth vector graphics. So for that, we invented something called subpixel accuracy, where the shape can be anywhere. And the goal is to figure out which pixels should be filled in and which ones shouldn't be. And that seems maybe difficult, but it's actually not that hard. Because we use the principle of sampling, where the color of a pixel is defined by the point exactly in the middle. If that one is inside the triangle, then the pixel is red, otherwise it's white. So that's a, a very simple principle, and that seems like it solves a lot of problems. Uh, and that means that there's really two worlds, right? Like on the left-hand side, you've got the vector world, where everything is mathematical. It's precise, exact, so you're working with with shapes and algebra and geometry. On the right-hand side, there's the, the raster world, the pixels uh, that have been sampled. And that's sort of a, a one-way final step. Because when you're doing computer graphics, you want to work as much as possible with the idealized representation on the left so that you can ensure quality of graphics and, and all those things. Uh, now, when, when you've turned something into samples, now it's a grid of things. Uh, so the fact that we're drawing every sample as a square pixel is in itself a choice. Uh, we call that the nearest neighbor filter. That's not that strange. Uh, but there's many alternatives. For example, you could use gradients uh, horizontally and vertically like this, which is called the bilinear filter. Looks a little bit better. Uh, you know, you don't get the, the sharp jaggies uh, on the pixel edges, but it still doesn't look smooth. It's still, you know, skipping around a bit. So how do we fix that? Well, the, the, the problem is that in, in choosing to work with samples, we've kind of ignored the entire pixel. Uh, the fact that the shape is, is moving to cover a pixel and then uncovering the pixel again is, is not taken into account. And you could do that analytically, like compute the actual coverage of the, the pixel by the shape. That's a lot of work. And it doesn't work very well when, say, you have a million triangles, because you have to to process every one of them individually. Uh, so what we do instead is we use a super sampling, where uh, you put multiple samples inside a pixel, usually in this sort of rotated grid arrangement, because it has uh, some interesting properties where basically if, if a horizontal or a vertical line sweeps across, it's going to trigger each of those samples individually rather than multiple at the same time, like if they were all on a row, for example. Uh, so that, that ensures that you get um, smooth stair steps. And so with, with even just four times super sampling, you can get rid of a lot of the objectionable artifacts of, of rendering, because uh, you would get four levels of, of transparency, right? Uh, or sorry, three levels of transparency between solid and completely invisible. Uh, but now you're doing four times as much work. It's generally not a good idea, because uh, if you're rendering four samples per pixel, why don't you just render it twice as wide and twice as high with way higher resolution? Well, because in practice, we use multi-sampling, where we, we selectively apply super sampling to certain pixels, generally the ones on the edge, uh, to make sure that the, the, the objectionable jaggies are gone and, and are mostly invisible. But in the middle, where everything's solid anyway, we don't really need to super sample. On the outside, we don't really need to super sample. And so again, that seems like we've, we've solved a lot of problems, and then everything's going great. But no, it's still not good, because there's something really fundamental that relates sampling to mathematics, and that's the, the sampling theorem. And so if, if you go and study uh, signal processing and deal with Fourier transforms, this is the, the bane of your existence. Uh, because it, in this case, for example, I've got a, a sine wave that generates these, these patterns of uh, white to black and white to black. And the, the pixels are, are sampling that color, 
and it, it looks pretty good, right? Like it's, it's moving from right to left and the representation of the pixels looks like what the curve is, just sampled very roughly. Unfortunately now, if I uh, squeeze the frequency, there's a certain critical point here, which is the Nyquist frequency, where if you look at the curve, it's going right to left, but if you look at the pixels, they're not moving anymore. They're just alternating in place, up and down, up and down. So you can't tell if it's going left or right anymore. And what's worse is if you keep going beyond this frequency, like for example, to the exact sampling frequency, now that it goes back to DC, direct current, that's, that's the electrical engineering heritage of this, this lingo, uh, where all the pixels are the same and there's, there's no bands, there's no more wave, it's completely wrong. But you can see why this happens, right? It's because the, the sampling is only looking at individual places, not at the whole. And we go beyond that, it gets worse because now it's moving from left to right. It's the complete opposite of what we're, we're trying to achieve and, and the frequency is wrong, it's, it's just completely wrong. And so if you, you move back to below the, the Nyquist frequency, in theory, this works uh, pretty well, but you, you're already starting to see this sort of um, left to right effect that is, is objectionable and gonna be noticeable. So if you really wanna avoid all sampling artifacts, you need to sample much lower, like for example this, or a quarter of your resolution to ensure that everything's gonna look good. And, and this is kind of why retina displays became so popular and, and made things look so much better, is because suddenly we have twice the amount of pixels and all those effects that we get when things aren't pixel aligned kind of become irrelevant. Uh, and so the, the, the general problem of aliasing creates these uh, moiré patterns, they're called, where the, the further in the distance here, because I'm applying this, this pattern on a plane, uh, eventually it goes completely wrong, right? And if you want to see that up close, I can show you that. You can see that there's a, a line of pixels that's moving in the wrong direction, right? Like this, this is the complete visualization of, of aliasing along many different frequencies effectively. And this is already bad, but if we move the camera, it gets worse. Like you get these, these really crazy patterns, right? They're just shifting and, and distracting and looks completely wrong. And to fix that, you actually would need hundreds and hundreds of samples for some of these pixels because one tiny pixel now covers a, a massive area in the distance in this 3D world. So in practice, what you do is you downsize it ahead of time. You know, you make copies of quarter size, eighth size, 16th size, you select the right one. So you only need to take one sample or maybe two samples, one from each level and blend between them. Uh, another topic that's really important when you're sampling, uh, especially when you're rendering 3D things, is what goes in front of what. So it, it, assuming that we can make shapes look good, there's still the problem of, of what goes first, what goes in the front. And it might seem like all you need to do is sort your layers back to front, right? The, the, the red triangle is, is bigger because it's, it's in front of the blue one. But that's not really always the case because shapes can intersect. And when shapes intersect, you can't draw them in. There, there's no correct order to draw them in. You need something else. So for that, we have a depth and, or, or Z buffer, it's called, or Z buffer. Uh, that's my Canadian giveaway. Uh, where we record the depth with every pixel. And so when you draw something, you can just check, uh, is this closer or further away than what's already there? And so in the case of these triangles, if I start rotating them in 3D, they can poke through each other on a per pixel basis, and the depth is always resolved correctly. So once again, it seems like, oh, we've solved all these problems. No, th things still aren't quite right because this principle only works for solid things. If you have transparent objects, like in this case, uh, they look solid from, the side, from one side, transparent from the other, because the order in which they're being drawn isn't changing. We're, we're expecting the Z buffer to, to fix this, but it can't because once a pixel is there, it, it's considered solid. So when you're drawing transparent things, you have to manually sort them or apply other techniques. And, and this is relevant for, for my kind of work is because I'm trying to do everything on a GPU. I can't sort, so I have to deal with this. 
So let's talk a little bit more about the actual GPU, the graphics processing unit that exists in, in your uh, phone and your laptops and everything. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about what's actually going on here. So uh, MathBox is a tool that I've, I developed a while ago to do mathematical visualization uh, that was GPU-driven in a browser. And so it, it had uh, pre-built shaders that enabled you to do certain kinds of uh, visualizations, like a, a polar coordinate visualization. And, and the emphasis was not just on, on rendering things, but on connecting them, being able to transition between you know, different states, different shapes. But it was all still, you know, you had a couple of Legos to play with, and that was it. Uh, what I've been working on since is a way to enhance this so anything is possible, where I can just add a transform to completely, you know, mess this up, <laughs> and everything just works. Now, what's going on here is this effect has two parameters. One is time. It's very simple. Time is just increasing, and I'm, a modular, I'm, I'm wrapping it around the graph just to, just to show that. But time is just increasing, assume it goes up. Uh, and that, again, seems quite obvious. But you know, if time stops, nothing moves. Uh, time should go on. And this, this kind of uh, playing with time is, is one of those things that, I've, I've, uh, that I like to do because I, I think time as a dimension is a very interesting quality to play with. Uh, there's another parameter, which is the intensity. And so we're going to start animating that a little bit, go all down. See, it's, it's, it's just a grid. And now the, the grid a little bit. It's going to shoot back up and get messed up. So that's fun. You got these, these two parameters that can just be animated, and they control the whole effect. Um, and so this is the code for that. This is the GLSL code that I'm injecting. Um, I'm not really going to go into much detail because it really is arbitrary. It's, it's just a random mishmash of numbers and sign functions and some swizzles. That's the, the Y, Z, W, X, where I'm you know, swapping channels and stuff. So it's, the, it's just a random thing. But what matters is that this is 120,000 vertices that are being animated at 60 frames per second. So this one piece of GLSL code that I injected is being called 7.2 million times per second. It's not a problem. Uh, and so what this is really is a mathematical function that takes x, y, and z coordinates and the time and intensity that I just said and produces a new one. And in doing so, you're, you're distorting the entire space, really, uh, where if I put a curve, for example, in here, that, that curve is going to shift, but it's really the, the, the entire fabric of the space that is warping continuously. So, so this is what you can do with uh, mathematical functions. This explains, um, or, or this hints at how, for example, the theory of general relativity talks about how space curves, uh, how, how these things are, are modeled using bizarrely simple formulas. And that's because when you apply functions, you have the power to warp spaces and manifolds exactly like this. Uh, so and what's worse, uh, what's weirder is if you put, for example, a surface in here, and it's, you know, I've, I've turned the intensity up all the way just because that's fun. Uh, but it isn't just being distorted. The points aren't just being moved by the transformation. The shading is changing too. And, and that should be kind of strange. I mean, it, it makes sense in, in real life. But when you think about it just from a purely computer graphics point of view, that's annoying that you can't distort things without having to relight it. Uh, and well, why is that happening? Well. In order to light something, we need something called a surface normal. And a uh, surface normal is quite simply an arrow that points up. So at every point on the surface, uh, we, we need an arrow that points straight up. And because the surface is warping, those directions are continuously changing. And then the, the lighting model that's being applied is, is very simple, where it's just if it points straight at the light source, it's brightest. If it you know, points a little bit away, it's a little bit darker. If it points 90 degrees or more away from the light source, it doesn't get any light because it's assumed to be in shadow. Uh, so how do, we, how do we get these normals? Because again, you know, the shape is being distorted in real time, and there, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, well, we need to see how it's constructed. And, and this gets into um, 
what's called UV mapping. UV is, is just a convention for the coordinates like X and Y. UV is, is just a different X and Y. Uh, where we have the surface that is uh, parameterized by in two directions, U and V, that's what those grid lines represent. Uh, and that surface is being warped by the, the warp function that we had previously. And out comes a point, P, that's, that's the point on the surface. So in order to calculate uh, normals, we need to look at the tangents. And, and this is, you know, getting into calculus where we take a partial derivative and then people's eyes are going to start glazing over. But the thing is, this isn't that hard. What you're, what you're doing is you're drawing an arrow between two neighboring points on the surface. That's you know, one little grid square, and then I've, I've stretched out the arrow a little bit so you can see it better. But that's all that it's doing. It's, it's connecting two neighboring grid points with an arrow and using that as the tangent direction. Uh, that's, that's the epsilon in the formula is the step. And in calculus, you, you, people like to take infinitely small steps, but in practice, just Finitely small ones are just fine, mostly. Because, you know, we only have 255 uh, color levels anyway. Why would you need more? So those are the, the U tangents in the U direction. We can do the same thing in the other direction with V. And that gives you this sort of uh, metric of, of what's going on at every point. And using these two vectors, which are just arrows, and then they're just, you know, a, a direction in space with a certain length, we can apply operations like the cross product. And, you know, the colors are very nice, and there's, there's a, a structure there that I won't go into too much, but it's, it's a way of crossing two arrows to get a third one that's always perpendicular. And so that's where those normals come from. Always a 90-degree angle of the, the U and the V vector, and those uh, are being used to light surface. So when this surface first appeared on the screen, this was already happening. This is what it's doing on the inside in order to make it look good. Uh, and now I've piled on even more visualization to visualize how it's visualizing, which is where this stuff gets really meta. In fact, so there, there's a new shader here where in order to calculate the normal, we, we need this little footprint, right? Those three arrows, uh, which means we're actually warping points three times per vertex. Um, on average, it comes out to about 2.5 uh, because some of, those, some of the surfaces aren't lit, so they don't need normals. But in total, this piece of code, the warp vertex, is now actually being called 127 million times per second, uh, in including all the extra visualization that's going on. So that's quite a lot. And we can do some more stuff here, where if instead of a normal, for example, we, we look at the original up direction, and we distort the original up as well. Uh, it's no longer going to point up, right? It's just going to point in a, a completely random direction. And those uh, three vectors basically tell you how the space is shaped and distorted. This uh, explains how, how angles change, how, uh, how, how, the, how, you know, how the, why the lighting changes is because the the angles of the space itself are just completely going off in different directions. It's no longer straight. So this is called a, a Jacobian matrix. This is usually something that scares students and makes no sense to them. But I don't think this concept is that hard. You, you can look at it in action and sort of understand that when you apply an arbitrary transformation, your directions shift and they're no longer straight. Which is, that's the basic principle uh, of what's going on. A uh, little bit, just a side note, about uh, algebra, that there's a, a three-dimensional matrix on the left, so that's just a set of three arrows. That's, that's all that that is. On the right, there's a four-dimensional matrix, which is a set of four four-dimensional arrows, which we somehow use in computer graphics. And what's actually going on there is that we've invented a new dimension as, as sort of a formalism to uh, enable us to move things around, not just in place, like not just you know, shift the directions, but also uh, move stuff around. It's confusing, but it really isn't that hard. You just get used to it. Just don't be scared by the word four-dimensional. It's not that bad. Um, however, you've been had if you were impressed by my numbers, because calling something 100 million times per second is, is not that surprising in a world of 1080p displays, where you know that's roughly 2 million pixels on a 1080p screen at 60 frames per second. Just to fill them all in, 
once, to touch them once, is already going to be 124 million calls per second. So, you, you know, your fancy hardware accelerated desktop, if you have overlapping windows and shadows, uh, you're looking at hundreds of millions of pixels per second being processed. And, and this is kind of just always uh, going on in the background. Now, we, specifically, what was, was just happening here is this transition effect, right? That's done in the pixel shader. And so let's, let's go actually look at the code, because I've been showing you a lot of things. But uh, th this is a graph of simple functions. So this returns a color and opacity as RGBA from a, a three vector and the opacity being passed in separately, because I, I want to animate those separately. Uh, there's also a mask that is being calculated from a per vertex value that was set. Uh, those are combined with a multiplication. And then out comes the color that is written to GL. So if, if you're familiar with GLSL, this shouldn't be that surprising. If, you're, if you don't and you're not that familiar with the C type languages, this might you know, seem kind of strange. But again, don't be afraid of it. It really isn't that hard. Uh, the point, though, of MathBox is that writing GLSL for everything is kind of annoying, because every GLSL program has to be written top to bottom. It has to be a main function, basically. Uh, no inputs, no outputs. And there's tools like GLSLify that bring, uh, due to GLSL, let's say Browserify did for JavaScript, it allows you to include other code, but it's still all statically defined. You're, you're writing a program ahead of time to do one thing. Whereas what I want to do is compose shaders dynamically so I don't have to think about the whole. I can just think about tiny pieces, like one transform that I want to slot in. And so that's the, the thing that I've kind of uh, been working on and exploring, is, is how to combine shaders like this. Oh. There we go. Uh, so this is a vertex shader for one of the objects before. I believe it is the arrows, <laughs> the vectors. And this is quite a lot more complicated. Uh, so this is a, a functional graph where this part takes care of the masking and that writes out the V mask value that the vertex shader, uh, that the pixel shader was using. Uh, and this thing here at the bottom calculates the transformation. It starts off with two points, x, y, z, and stpq. Adds some padding, does a resample. And here's the code that I injected. So this, this is the only piece of code that I wrote myself here to, to make this effect work. Uh, everything else comes from MathBox, so to speak. So this is the polar transformation that does the circular to polar warping, uh, the camera view, and closing off the chain. And this then gets called by a sampler that leads to arrow position, which <laughs> orients the little arrow cones. And finally, you get the final position. And so if you had to do all this by yourself for every single 3D thing you had to render, that would be way too much work. And so that's what this entire project was about, was uh, enabling composition on a GPU beyond uh, statically defined things. Let me get out of my frame again. There we go. So the hardware that we have these days, especially with VR, as Jaume was talking about, is, is incredibly powerful. You've got... Um, the NVIDIA GTX 980 uh, has 336 gigabytes per second, famously has 5 billion transistors. Uh, the more interesting number that I find is the, the 5 teraflops, uh, because if you actually go and look, uh, this is the IBM Blue Gene P. The picture's not 100% correct. It's my fault. But in 2007, one of these cabinets had 5 teraflops. And so today, that's just one of these puppies. And you get numbers like 3.3 trillion bits per second. That is, that's not an exaggeration at all. That's the objective uh, ability of these things. And so that also means that your phone, that you know, your fancy smartphone, is probably equivalent to a Dell box from the mid 2000s. Not as fancy. Uh, and so this stuff is what drives generally video games, right? Video game graphics. Uh, I, I, this is an example from Alien Isolation. Uh, I really like this game, but also because it's gorgeous. The, the, not just the styling and the, the visual design, but the rendering is, is really, really good. The lighting is, is incredibly well done. You get these images that seem near photorealistic, right? It, it's hard to tell if this is a picture from a set or a picture from a video game. It's actually from a video game. 
and that's a scary alien that you have to deal with. Uh, the two, another two examples that I included because it's kind of interesting, this is Crisis 3, so this was the, the previous generation of consoles, and you can kind of sort of see in the background there's still a lot of fog, and any time you see that in a video game, you know it's because they wanted to draw more, but they couldn't because it was too slow. Whereas nowadays, on the PlayStation 4, for example, that problem has gone away. They've effectively got infinite draw distance. The, the, that's the difference between one generation of consoles and the next. So there's an incredible amount of computational power here. Which means supercomputing has kind of just become background radiation. It's, it's everywhere, uh, from, from the displays in your pockets to the laptops to the, the consoles to the TVs. They, they all have to do incredible amounts of computation to make this stuff work. And we're kind of blissfully unaware. Uh, so finally, I want to just quickly talk a little bit um, about practical stuff with WebGL, stuff that I, that I learned from this, uh, which is the first is uh, pre-allocate as much as possible and avoid garbage collection and trigger warning coffee script because it's a two-year-old code base and you know that was the state of things then. Uh, where, where you want to allocate your buffers and your objects and your state ahead of time and only change values. You don't want to allocate new things. Because you know, doing that 120 million times per second is going to make Chrome V8 cry. Uh, another thing that's a, a problem is text rendering in WebGL. This is the, the big problem that everybody deals with. And the, the good solution seems to be something called signed distance fields, where you, you create this image like the one at the top. And then dynamically, you apply a contrast, which is like the, the curves tool in Photoshop, to actually make it crisp for a certain size. So based on the image at the top, you can render text at, at a relatively wide uh, range of sizes. And you can also use this to do outlining, which is very useful for, for rendering you know, labels in 3D on top of other things. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to generate a signed distance field easily in a browser. So I've had to come up with a technique to fake it with Canvas which comes down to drawing uh, progressively smaller outlines with stroke text and then doing a post-processing effect on that. A lot of work. Uh, the other thing is that little loading spinner that I put in, which I, I don't like. I wish it was faster. Unfortunately, when you create a shader in WebGL, you have to compile it synchronously. And as you've seen with the graphs that I create, you can imagine all that code combined is, is quite big. It takes a little while to compile. It's, it's not the end of the world, but it is annoying. Uh, so I had to deal with that. Uh, a thing that is ridiculous is if you want to read floating point numbers from a GPU with WebGL, you can't. You can only read back bytes, which means if you want to read back floating point, what you do is you make a shader that encodes a floating point number as an RGBA uh, number. I, I didn't come up with this, luckily. Somebody else already did the work, because IEEE floats are not your friend. And this is the kind of ridiculousness that you have to deal with uh, sometimes. Another problem is, is so all this multi-sampling stuff that I was talking about, you can use that, but you can't do anything with a multi-sampled result. It's only uh, the final result. So if you want to do post-processing effects, like you know uh, cinematic effects, you kind of have to give up multi-sampling. Uh, and there's also order independent transparency, which is a, a technique that's relatively recent that solves the z-buffer problem, so where things that are transparent aren't layered correctly. But you can't use it uh, without rendering in two passes because, again, WebGL lacks certain capabilities. So that's, uh, again, annoying. Now, there's a website called uh, WebGL Stats by uh, a guy named Florian Bush, who's one of the people who's very active on, on the WebGL mailing lists that tracks the actual support for this stuff. So th despite the fact that you know, I'm painting a bleak picture, uh, things are getting better, and you have really good information on, on what you can and cannot use in certain situations. So that's great. This site is a public treasure. It does not get enough recognition. Uh, and another problem that, that Florian in particular has, has worked on too is that life performance scaling with WebGL is quite difficult, because you, you can you get a request animation frame. You can see oh, it's just taking way too long to render. But you can only scale down progressively. Um, once you're rendering at 60 frames per second, there's no way for you to know how much slack do I have. C could I render twice as much? You don't know, because the request animation frame clock is just going to keep happening. So actually, dealing with WebGL content that could work well on a low-powered smartphone as well as a, a fancy laptop is really difficult. You kind of just have to aim low and uh, scale up very conservatively. Uh, 
So the sort of the question of <laughs> what is WebGL? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, it's really good. I will say this. It's just the problem wasn't just how do we bring uh, computer graphics into the browser. WebGL was the first time that they actually took an existing API and tried to make it work on the web wholesale. Uh, and that's why there's these like, odd gaps here and there, is because they had to invent a whole security model to make this stuff work. But that just didn't exist before. So if, if you're uh, playing a video game on your laptop that's a native application, they're talking directly to the driver, and you can be sure that there would be bugs that a developer worked around that, that would be considered a security issue in a browser. So a lot of the work in making this stuff work was, was meta. It was, it was work about the work. That's why we ended up with what we have today. A good question that was raised uh, this week that I heard, I forget who said it, where would WebGL be without 3.js? I think this is a, a very important observation. 3.js is one of the main drivers that made uh, WebGL accessible. Um, and luckily, things are improving. So there's this work being done on WebGL2 that will be an improvement that, that adds a couple things. Uh, it, it still doesn't quite you know, match uh, what you get as a native developer, but there's, there's definitely improvement. The other thing that people are talking about is, is Vulkan, which is sort of the, the next generation OpenGL, which will maybe have a web Vulkan at some point. Uh, this is basically the open version of APIs like Apple's Metal, uh, where they, they want a graphics API that is more multi-core, more par parallelizable, is, is more natively threaded, and it's basically what they already use when they program game consoles. So the situation on a game console like a PS4 is you have you know, luxurious access to the hardware. You have one machine that you're targeting. It's kind of blissful compared to the stuff we have to do on the web. Uh, but, you know, reach versus uh, accessibility is always a problem. Uh, the, the thing that I also want to bring up that I find really interesting is that there's work being done on something called Spear, uh, which is based on LLVM. So this is in the same realm of things like ASM.js and all that cross-compiling, uh, where this might enable um, packaging of shaders as binary modules that don't need to be compiled, but that can just be put in straight, straight into the driver uh, and then translate it to the um, hardware's own instruction format really quickly. So uh, we definitely don't have to compose shaders as source code forever. It's just that right now, that seems to be the, the, the best way to do it. Um, now, time-wise, I'm pretty much at the end, so I am going to leave it at that. I haven't released this code base yet. I will be putting the slides online and uh, talking more about this stuff um, as I can write the docs and explain it. There, there really isn't um, more right now than I have shown you. So thank you to everyone who made uh, WebGL happen. There, there's some people there on the mailing list, too many to name, too many to thank, that did a lot of work to, um, to bring this to life, and it's what enables what you saw today. Thank you very much for listening.